What is up, everyone? It's Javier with the Enrich Fires, and today we're going to be talking about Disney Star Wars, particularly some information we got from the head runner of the new show, The Acolyte, which her name is Leslie Headland. Now, a little preamble before this, uh, if some of you may know, some of you may not know, not a fan of Disney Star Wars, uh, been not a fan of the stuff they put out. Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker were terrible. They're some of the worst written films I have may have ever seen. They make no sense, and, who, and they weren't put in a lot of time, effort, or care into them from what I know. And as far as the other films, like Rogue One, that's like fine. It's the most inoffensive one, maybe the best one out of the movies now. Solo is completely forgettable, and I've only seen it once, and I have no words to ever watch Solo again. I just don't care. And uh, in terms of the other Star Wars stuff, there's been some good things here. Like Mandalorian, I like. I have a lot of problems with Mandalorian in terms of how it goes as a story. But I like, but I would rather watch Mandalorian. And in terms of like, let's say the Clone Wars stuff coming out, I've only seen like two episodes of The Bad Batch and I don't really care to watch the rest. I'm really not interested in The Bad Batch. I don't find them the show that interesting. I don't find the characters that interesting. In terms of the Clone Wars, the season seven, the last four episodes, I enjoyed those pretty well and I liked uh, the way they presented them. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, mostly in terms of Disney Star Wars, not a fan, and I'm not really excited for anything they're putting out. Now, in terms of the shows they announced, like the 10 shows, I was kind of interested slash maybe looking forward to The Acolyte based off its premise being set in an era outside of the trilogy, which is what I've been wanting all along. I'm like, between one and nine, don't do any movies in there. Go outside. Go before episode one. Yeah, before episode one, because I really don't care what happens after episode nine, personally. So... Uh, before episode one, go outside the main nine films in terms of timeline. So that's what it's going to do. And it's going to focus on a, I think, a dark side apprentice. So it's like, that can be cool. A new perspective. And the other show is kind of interesting with Star Wars Visions because I hear that's going to be like an animatrix except Star Wars, uh, you know, focus themed. So be like, yeah, that could be kind of cool. But after seeing this, I have concerns and I may not be excited for the Acolyte anymore. Could still be good. Maybe when it comes out, whenever it does, but from what I'm seeing, this this is not making me excited. So what I wanted to go do is talk about these points, so let's go ahead and get into it. So this is a tweet from user called Data Eraser, and writes, Leslie Hanlon interview on her new show. Thinks Star Wars is about politics and fan opinions aren't valid. Hired a writer who's never seen Star Wars. Female and queer representation is a top priority. I literally cry whenever I see it. This is going to be a train wreck. Now, I do think that this show is probably not going to be good just based off the history of Disney Star Wars. However, there are some things here that are misrepresented regarding Leslie Hadland's comments, particularly the first one. Now, the thing about politics, yes, she does think that, but fan opinions are invalid. She actually never said that in the article itself. I've looked. If you click here, you can see in terms of the fan, she never said that. We'll go ahead and read it right now. It's somewhere near the, the top here, that question regarding the passionate fan base. So here you go. When you, uh, so this is uh, ABC, AV Club asking her the questions, and these are her responses. When you have such a long history with something, be it books or movies or TV, you can get possessive of it. But Star Wars is something that's enjoyed by so many people. And there's this really, shall we say, passionate fan base. Is that one of the more challenging things about entering this universe as a creator? Or do you embrace the idea of engaging with a fandom? Yeah, but I would say I do it passively, meaning I really enjoy watching what people put together, whether it's videos or memes. The participation of Star Wars fans in social media is something that just makes me excited. I don't know how else to put it. It just makes me feel like everybody's got their own thing that they love about Star Wars. To me, Star Wars has always been a little bit of a Rorschach, uh, I can't say that word, dang it, test of a piece of art. A lot of times, it is what you decide it is. I think Matrix is a really good example of that as well. You have fans that really run the gamut in terms of their political or social identities, and yet it's still a piece of art that really speaks to people on the very base level. So to me, seeing a fandom as passionate as Star Wars is certainly intimidating, but it's also understandable because it's a great work of art. And to be part of it is, yeah, it's daunting, but it's also something that, if I didn't feel passionate about my love for it, then possibly would be something that was too frustrating or scary. Because I feel so passionate about it, I know that my love for it is rooted in a strong point of view. So as you can see there, she didn't, and I looked otherwhere in the article, I don't see anywhere where she says, like, oh, I don't care about the fan opinions or the fan opinions aren't valid. She just says, like, oh, I engage passively on regards to the fans or social media. 
And, you know, I, I, I see as the participation of Star Wars fans on social media, something that just makes me excited, you know, in that seeing a fandom as passionate as Star Wars is certainly intimidating, but it's also understandable because it's a great work of art. So she doesn't say fans' opinions are invalid. And I can't find it. Maybe I'm missing it. I've looked through the article before starting this video, and I can't, and I can't seem to find it, really. So... Maybe I'm missing it. If, if someone can catch it, let me know. I'd be more than happy to correct myself. But she doesn't say fan opinions are invalid. That's a misrepresentation here. But in terms of the other things, it seems pretty accurate. So let's move on to the other point. So the political one. So let's get here because they he screenshots the s stuff that thing supports uh, the, uh, the points he's making. So let's look here. And that goes for ideology as well. I mean, it's funny because a lot of the feedback that I'll get and I use the term feedback very lightly. So that could be part of maybe like she doesn't care about the fans' opinions. Well, depends on, well, some opinion, some feedback may not be valid. There, There is such a thing. Now, again, she doesn't say exactly that they don't matter. But in terms of feedback, there's going to be some feedback you value and some feedback you don't. You know, so... Let's just, let's just go ahead and move on past that, and let's get to the rest of this. But when I do go on social media, the feedback is, don't make Star Wars political. I'm like, George Lucas made it political. Those are political films. War is, by nature, political. That's just what's up. So here's the thing. Uh, when people say, don't make Star Wars political, what they're saying is, is that don't make it a representation of the politics we have today. Here's the thing with Star Wars. Basically, the original trilogy is an empire, you know, an oppressive fascist empire, you know, and a bunch of rebels trying to fight them off. So it's basically like, I guess, World War II in space, and I believe that's actually what George Lucas based it off of. He basically wanted to, he based it a lot off of the events of like, well, not the events, but just the event itself of World War II. You know, it's World War II in space. And the thing is, when people say don't make source political, they're like, don't. What a lot of these people mean, from what I can see and from what I've read, is that they don't want politics over story. They want the story to come first. They want the entertainment to come first. They want the character arcs, the writing to come first, not political ideology. When most people say don't make stories political, they don't want to see someone push their political ideologies or try to preach to the audience about something they should believe in terms of political beliefs onto them. You know, in Star Wars, it's universal themes that mostly everyone can agree on, like redemption, like uh, the, the theme of redemption with Darth Vader by the end. The, the whole arcs are like universal, like Luke, you know, not turning to the dark side, not giving in, you know, doing what is right. These are universal themes in a lot of stories that mostly anyone can get behind. They want things like that. When you just push a certain political perspective, that can turn off a lot of people. And in terms of me, you know, I'm not really excited for a lot of the things Hollywood's coming out because it just seems to be pushing shows made for the basis of a trying to push a political ideology or push an agenda rather than tell me a good story and entertain me. And if you are a writer who is trying to write a piece of entertainment, it is your job to get deliver the best story you can and write the best story you can and make the best character arcs you can. And if you put things like representation or political ideologies or political agendas above that in sacrifice of the story, a lot of people are going to be turned off and your story is going to suffer. It's happened before. Look at Batwoman. That thing is huge push on a lot of uh, p different political ideologies, particularly, you know, uh, I guess left-leaning, uh, definitely. But it pushes a lot of political stuff. And the story, everyone hates it because everyone says the story sucks. The writing is garbage. The characters make no sense. Nothing makes sense about this universe. They're pulling this all out of their rear ends. And it's true. I've seen a lot of coverage of like the Batwoman show because it's hilarious. It is some of the most w poorly written garbage I've ever seen. But it's super political. But the story sucks. And everyone says it sucks. And viewership is low for that show. The ratings are terrible for it. So the thing is, what you have to decide as a writer is, are you going to try to do the best story you can, which is what it should be, or are you going to try to push as many political ideologies and political ideas that you favor into it as best you can?
And the thing is, one is going to appeal more to an audience than the other, and it's not going to be the political one. It's going to be the story. You as a writer need to tell me the best story. When I go to a theater or when I want to watch something, I don't want to be preached to. This is the same problem, let's say, with Christian films. Okay, I criticized, I have a review on my channel, The God's Not Dead 2 movie. And I criticize that it's just trying to push stuff, that the story sucks, that it makes no sense, the character motivations make no sense. Everything, nothing makes sense about that film. It's terribly written. But it wasn't made for that. The God's Not Dead 2 was made to push uh, a, a, a Christian narrative. So, same thing here. It's all about pushing narrative over story. You as, when I want to go to a theater, I want to be entertained. I want to be taken to a new world. I want to escape my reality. I want to escape the problems of my world, especially the political ones. A lot of people do. They, especially like, let's say their job is heavily political based. You think when they go home, they want to engage in more politics? Probably want to go home. They want to sit down in their chair, turn on their TV and get some entertainment out. Get, they want to be escape, escapism. They want to escape, go to a new world, take me to an, an adventure. Give me some characters to care about. Give me a story to care about. Give me some stakes that develop tension and uh, things like that. You know, give me something to latch on to. Give me something to care about. Take me to another world. Let me explore the world. Let me explore the characters. That's more what people want. That's what they, that's what they go to a movie for. A lot of the times. They don't want the idea. They want to escape reality. That's kind of the point. And if every single thing that's coming out of Hollywood in terms of entertainment and stuff is all pushing these things, it's going to turn people off. I know a lot of people that don't watch a lot of mainstream Hollywood, and they just watch the older stuff. They watch stuff. They just rewatch a lot of the great things like Lord of the Rings. So again, you need to prioritize story. Because here, we're going to go ahead and read some more of this. To have the power when you're creating media is just to put certain types of people that maybe aren't necessarily in normal mainstream content or media. It's just... I know for that for people who don't identify that way, it doesn't seem that important, but to us it's huge. I literally saw an Orbitz commercial with two women going on vacation and I was like, again, crying. It just hits you on a level you don't know you're missing until you see it. Okay, here's the thing, Leslie. Like, really? Just seeing it makes you cry? I mean, you do you, that's fine, but like, seems a bit odd that the instance you see just that like this is the thing this is this is the problem is that this is so important to her that literally seeing it makes her cry and i'm like okay so she's definitely going to be putting this kind of representation thing as a huge part of the deal and it's fine if you want to do representation but do it well in a good story like coco I'm pretty sure for Coco, like Disney Pixar's Coco, that was a huge part of it was, you know, uh, Mexican and Latino representation. But they put it in a story in a world, you know? It served the story, not the story serving a political ideology. So this is this is the issue with uh, these quotes here regarding about, you know, her crying over seeing representation. It's like, okay, that's fine. But it can't be in sacrifice of the story. For And I, and I don't care about um, if your character is gay, trans, bi, or is a different race, Latino, black, whatever, I don't care. I, I care about the con I care about the content of the character in terms of the arc of the story. How they start, what event they get involved in, uh, what adventure they go on, how they change and evolve, and who they are at the end. The character arc. Okay, for example, I'm I'm watching the Owl House. Okay? And I'm liking that show a lot. I'm liking the characters, I'm liking the story, I'm liking uh, the world building a bit, and, and things of that nature. And I'm liking Loose and Amity, you know? But the reason why I like Loose and Amity is not just because they're bi or they're a different race alone. It's because of the character traits they exhibit, how fun they are, or, uh, you know, what it's like to be around them, the personality vibes they get off of. That's what I like. And I want, and I'd be fine seeing Loose and Amity. In fact, I want to see Loose and Amity, you know, get together. It's all service of the story. The story is what's first. The story is why we like them. It's not just because they're bi or they're queer or they're trans or they're black, Latino, whatever. It's the content of their character. It's their character arcs. It's the, it's the personalities they, get off, they give off. It's why people like them. Let me see here. Uh, here's one. There is, so let's move on to another quote here. There were people like myself that were like later in life felony acolytes. I literally had one writer who was like, I have never seen any of them. I have never seen any Star Wars media. She texted me right before this and she was like, Luke and Leia are brother and sister? What the? 
So here's the thing. In terms of that writer, I guess if they have to keep her on, she should definitely not write anything in regards to Star Wars lore or Star Wars uh, history, world building, that kind of deal. Maybe she could more focus on the ba the basic fight writing fundamentals, assuming she's good at it, like character arc or you know plot structure and things like that. But if you've never seen Star Wars before, then that's kind of a problem when you're a making a Star Wars show. You got to get some basic fundamentals down, for sure. And if you're not an expert, or you're not a passionate fan, then maybe you can work on other aspects of the story that are not so heavily focused on the universe. Like I said, like character arc or something. But in general, maybe you should, like wh whoever this is, like as long as the other writers are very, I guess, into Star Wars or know a lot about Star Wars, that at least can help. But I would think maybe it not be a general idea to get someone to write if they don't know anything about it. Or if they don't know anything, like, have them start learning. Have them watch the movies. Have them watch the shows to get an idea of what Star Wars is. So that they're more prepared to write a Star Wars story. That's probably the best thing to do. So, yeah, I think that's about it. In terms of this show, I'm not really that that uh, excited for it. But I'm not really excited for anything Disney Star Wars, really. Um, I'm not excited for Andor. I don't know why they're making a show on Andor. He was such a blank character. And we know he dies later, so why are we focusing on him? We'll see if they maybe put out something here and there. There could be something that they do. But again, I'm just not excited. Um, in terms of the Acolyte, we'll see what happens. I don't know if it's going to be good. I don't think it's going to be good. It's based off the history of Disney Star Wars. And we'll see what happens when it comes out. It could be good. Could be good. I could be wrong. Maybe it's better written than I might give it credit for. But we won't know until it comes out. So let's see then. Uh, all right. So I think that's about the end of this video. Before I end this, I'm going to give a quick update. I think I might want to make a in-depth critique analysis of the Loki show. And I might want to do that before the boys because it's relevant right now. And I think it could be worth a worthy uh, show to give an in-depth critique analysis on because there is a lot of things in the show that don't make sense. But I actually may actually have some hope for the show. If you saw my last video, you saw that I was not, not pleased at all with Loki episode one because of how it changes the MCU. The last two episodes, the episode two and three, are possibly leading somewhere where they maybe could fix some things, not all things, but some things to possibly make it better. And maybe it maybe the show could go up a bit from there. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, I, I definitely am more liking where it's kind of going because it's possibly going to maybe fix some things regarding what we know about the MCU, possibly. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know for sure. We'll have to see. But yeah, I might want to make an in-depth critique and analysis on that, and I think it might be fun. So yeah, thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, go ahead and leave a like. And if you want to see more content like this, go ahead and subscribe. What do you think about this whole uh, situation regarding the Acolyte? If, go ahead and leave a comment down below and let me know. And I will see you in the next video, whenever that is. Take care.